This episode of the Stockberry Dark is brought to you by Shop Shogun. Shop Shogun is your one-stop shop for the latest and greatest in punk, hardcore, and heavy metal merchandise. Officially licensed web stores from bands such as 100 Demons, Integrity, Disembodied, Madball, Agnostic Front, and many more. The Stockberry Dark, along with Shop Shogun, are offering a special code to discount your next order when you use it on their website. Use the promo code SDPODCAST to save 10% from your next order from Shop Shogun. Again, the code is SDPODCAST. Their website is shopshogun.com. Also, check out their page, Shop Shogun, on Facebook and at Shop Shogun Merch on Instagram. This is Klaus from the Stockbird Dark. I would like to take the opportunity to thank all of you who's listening and also thank all of you who's sharing and rating the Stockberry Dark. We touch on subjects that can be hard to express. Sometimes we touch on experiences that are painful to talk about. Hauntings, the occult, the paranormal, and darkness in different shapes. Me and Pete would therefore like to thank all our guests, friends, past and present, for being a part of this. We didn't know what to expect but the response has been nothing short of fantastic. In all this darkness, you make us glow. Thank you. You can find us at thestockbearedark.com, on Podcaster, and on iTunes. For interaction, visit the official Stockbear Dark on Instagram and the Stockbear Dark on Facebook. If you want to get in touch with us, you will reach us at thestockbearedark at gmail.com. Please continue to rate us and share our episodes. What we do is for you. Welcome to the Stockberry Dark. Hello and welcome to the Stockberry Dark. My name is Peter Morsey. I'm Klaus out in Stockholm, Sweden. And today we have a very special guest. Like I think every episode has a special guest, but uh, this one's extra special. It's, uh, it's a Connecticut native, old friend of mine, um, Greg Benick. Hello, Greg. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited. I'm excited to be an extra special guest. Yes, special guest. Welcome, <laughs> Greg. Really special. Uh, Greg is the singer of uh, Trial, Between Earth and Sky. He has a new band, Bystander. Um, a lot of you guys listening from our world will know him as that. Greg's also many accolades under his belt. He's a professional speaker, um, humanitarian, filmmaker, musician, writer. Um, many projects under his belt. Um, uh, so many, so many awesome things this guy has done. Um, 100 for Haiti is one of his uh, brainchilds, and we can, can talk about that a little bit, Greg, if um, if you want. And uh, absolutely, absolutely. Now, with 100 for Haiti, that's it's like a relief and development project you do in in Haiti. I know you yeah, travel there quite a bit. Yeah, it's more it's more development now than relief, and I'll give you uh-huh. the uh, the five cent version of the difference. You know, when we started, we were doing relief, meaning we were bringing supplies to people. And in time, we realized that if you just keep giving people relief supplies, they become dependent on that relief. So we switched over to development, meaning trying to figure out ways that we could support Haitians developing their rural communities. So Mm -hmm. we focus on two areas. One is anti-sexual assault education, and the other is anti-cholera work in the north of Haiti. So both of those areas are you know, explained on 100forhaiti.org and or 100fh.org if people want an easier URL. And mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I've been doing it for eight years now. 
That's fantastic, Greg. Yeah, tremendous work you do, man. Um, you know, I've known you for a long time. In the last few years, we've definitely made a connection and talk talk a lot more. And um, honestly, Greg, I had no idea how deep your like work goes and your speaking career and how much you've done until I visited your Wikipedia page, and I was really blown away. Like, oh, that's you know, amazing! I'm so, I'm so glad to hear that. I spent I a day very, on that thing. Yeah, you definitely could. I got <laughs> I got lost in there. It's like really very proud to know you, man. And uh, oh, that's amazing! I'm really so happy to, to have that. you here. And um, so you know, obviously, we we talked a bit about the stock very dark, and it's it's a bit different from a lot of things that most podcasts and conversations we're going to have outside of our music. You know, be the, this podcast being more about the supernatural, the occult, dark type topics, and uh, you know, the basis was always. It's starting as people from our music scene that we're talking to um, who have such stories, you know. So when I asked you to do this a while ago and you said you would have things to talk about, I was really excited to get you on here. Um, Absolutely. And so I guess we can get right into to some of the topics, you know, that that we kind of briefly texted back and forth with uh, a couple of days ago. Um, if there's anything sure. you want to start with, you know, we can just kind of go from there. Absolutely. You know, so I, I have a strange relationship with the supernatural in that I've had at least one absolutely unquestionably unexplainable experience in my life that can only be explained by way of the supernatural. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, I've got some other ones that are just, you know, a little unusual and weird. And we can get into like Haitian voodoo and stuff like that. Mm. But then at the same time, there's the part of me that's like, there is no God. There is no, um, you know, a force outside myself which dictates and guides the experiences of my life. Mm -hmm. We are we are all just, you know, literal creatures in a literal world, and we eventually die and rot away. And there's no heaven and hell, right? Mm -hmm. So that side of me suggests that there shouldn't be supernatural experiences. But I can start off by telling you about one that I have no explanation for other than the supernatural, regardless of how atheistic I might be at other points in my life. Mm -hmm. Um. So I, I, I grew up in Connecticut, and I had a very dear friend of mine uh, named Stephanie, and uh, she, she was one of my, she was maybe my best friend uh, throughout uh, junior high school and high school and whatnot, and her dad and I became very good friends. Her dad was um, named John, and he was really interested in theater, as was I growing up, and we would talk about the, the kind of like... Um, like more or less the spiritual side of theater, meaning not just like, oh man, I like acting on the stage, but rather what does it mean to perform and what does it mean to watch a performance and the, the philosophy, I guess you'd say, behind theater. So we would spend a lot of nights uh, in Waterbury, actually, sitting mm -hmm. up talking and a lot of days sitting up talking and just drinking tea and talking about the theater. And then I moved to Seattle to study uh, acting and theater at Cornish College of the Arts. Wait, what, year did, what year did you move to Seattle? Uh, 1991. I moved there in, in, uh, in the summer of 1991. I came in as a sophomore in college in, 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 uh, in the fall of 91 at Cornish. And, uh, John and I lost touch, you know, as I was studying and really focusing on, on graduating and that sort of thing. So this is where the supernatural part of the story comes in. So John was never quite well. Uh, physically, meaning he just had physical ailments, just one of these people who's just plagued by chronic stuff of various mm -hmm. kinds. And at one point, I was, uh, well, all throughout the 90s, I was living in a very small uh, studio apartment on, on Capitol Hill in Seattle. And the way this the apartment was set up was that I had a, a, a small bedroom the size of a bed. And the way that my bed was set up was that, as I say, sat up in bed, I look, looked through a tiny doorway and through that doorway was the kitchen area. I guess it was technically a one bedroom, but still you'd look through the doorway and there was a kitchen area where my refrigerator was. And one night I was uh, asleep in, in my place and it was, it was dark in my place. This wasn't a well lit apartment. It was a basement apartment. And as I was asleep, I was awoken at one point, I guess it was, as I remember it around 1am, but it might've been a little bit later. And there was this split second where as I kind of sat partially up, I looked through the doorway and standing in front of my refrigerator was John. Now, remember, I've said that this was a split second that this happened, meaning that in a split second, my brain registered, oh, that's John. 
that Stephanie's dad, John, oh, hi, John, right? In that split second as he was sta- just standing in front of the refrigerator through the doorway across the room. And then as I kind of shook my head like, wait, what? Why, 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 is, why is John standing in, in my kitchen? There was no one standing in my kitchen, okay? So I was freaked out like, okay, here I am in Seattle and John's in Connecticut and why did that happen? Uh, and I kind of fell asleep thinking those thoughts. And I was awoken the next morning by a phone call from my friend Stephanie. And she sounded upset. And I asked her what was wrong. And she said that her father had died during the oh night. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Wild. Wild. So, <laughs> I mean, so here, you know, here's what I can say is that, you know, do I believe in ghosts? Yeah and no. Do I believe in gods? Yeah, yeah and no. Mm-hmm. I could philosophize about that stuff all day long. But what I know is that I woke up in the night and John was standing in my kitchen and there's no reason that I would have in, I would have like, um, like, like back, back created that story. Meaning mm-hmm. I didn't, you know, the next morning I didn't go, Oh, Stephanie, your dad died. Well, uh, I think he was, might've been in my kitchen. You know, I, you know, this is too wow. weird. It's too dumb. I literally thought it, saw it, felt it. I, as I'm talking to you, I remember it as, as, as plainly as I can remember Holy Land and the Naugatuck Valley Mall in Connecticut. I mean, like my memories of both of those experiences and seeing like Connecticut, you know, things are as clear as, uh, seeing John in my kitchen. And then I found out the next day that he had died. Wow. So you, you know, previously you said you haven't spoke, you hadn't spoken to him in quite some time before that, before you. Yeah. In quite a while. I don't remember what yeah. year he died, but I don't think it was right when I moved to Seattle. I think it mm-hmm. was, uh, it was probably, it would have been, well, actually, let's think about this, because I, I moved to Seattle in fall of 91. I moved into that apartment sometime in the spring of 92. So, yeah, I would have I would have lost, you know, touch with him more or less, um, you know, during that first year at school. Mm-hmm. So, at the very least, it was, he died in spring of 92, maybe 93, maybe 94. I don't even remember. But whenever it was, it had been a while since we'd talked. Right. So. And Do you recall also, like any thoughts of him previously? Like, oh man, I haven't I haven't spoken or thought of John in a while. And like, you know, sometimes you'll think of somebody. The next thing you know, your phone is ringing, or you bump oh, to that person. You know, it happens. I mean, it must happen twenty times a week with me. It just me happened too. to me ten minutes before I called you. You know, it's something very small where I haven't thought of somebody, and their name popped in my head, and I looked down. You know, just terrible to say. I looked at like Instagram and I saw they liked one of my photos and I haven't talked to this person in two years, you know? And, uh, the, I'm wondering if you maybe had a thought of, of John and that there was like, some I probably, sort of connection, yeah, I probably know? did. I, I, he had given me a book called the mysteries of Pittsburgh, as I remember by a guy named Michael Chabon, if I'm saying or remembering his name correctly. And I remember reading the mysteries of Pittsburgh and dabbling with it. And I remember feeling a little guilty that I hadn't finished the book, or maybe I'd finished the book and I felt guilty that I hadn't talked to him about it. Um, but I think that, that those thoughts were probably on my mind mm-hmm. and okay. So now if I'm speaking, from the side of me that believes in all this stuff wildly. <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe he was, you know, saying a goodbye, but also completing the experience and, and right. somehow letting me know that it was okay. And I, you know, that I, that we hadn't talked about the book before he, he passed away. And of course that's me applying meaning to this experience. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think that as humans, we, we want, to a have meaning in our own lives, but we want to apply meaning to things that we don't understand around us. And this is a perfect example, but yeah. it makes sense to me, you know, I mean, yeah, very much so. And it, it's, you know, it speaks to what Pete was talking about, about how, when you think of somebody and suddenly their presence pops up in your life, mm-hmm. that happens as Pete said, all the time. What is that? Like if, if we just talk for a second and try to, figure that out I'd, I'd feel a lot better about yeah. about because they're like these like momentary bits of like the psychic connections that you have where you know who knows how our brain is working or what, what types of like energies it's uh emitting but i think there's like these weird little escapes that happen where you just have these almost premonitions and you don't even realize they're premonitions until boom two seconds later what was on your mind ju- just appears I agree. It's, and it's so bizarre. It does happen all the time. You'll think about somebody you haven't talked to in years and all of a sudden they call you or, 
just you'll, they'll, they'll, you'll their name will come up in conversation. And what I what I wonder is, you know, like you've, you've suggested, what kind of energy is going on there? But what what is that? Because mm-hmm. if that's if that's a thing, meaning if okay, we know that those connections happen. That's a given. That's a fact. Like meaning somebody will pop up after you've thought about them after the longest time. They'll pop into your life. That's an actual thing. Everybody knows it. So if it's true that we have these energetic connections amidst ourselves, then, then it opens up tons of doors. Like right. it kind of, kill, it kills off the, the, the naysayer Greg part of me w- way more than anything else does. Because if all of a sudden I start thinking about my friend, whomever, and they can call me, how can we then harness or channel that energy? Mm-hmm. And, you know, then do I sound like a crazy person or do I sound like a practical <laughs> inventor? You know, I know. And those are the types of things I think of like, because sometimes I can sit here and I will tr- I will literally try to will things to happen, and that never that never works. You know, it's almost when you're let when your guard is completely down and and the thoughts are not there that it's that's when it's happening. I can, I can't imagine like willing something happening from from thinking of someone to making them appear to like staring at a pencil and trying to get it roll across a table. You know, which I've done. You know, I've sat there, <laughs> literally tried as crazy as it sounds to like move things. You know. I would I can safely say that a, a good a good chunk of my years seven eight and nine growing up in, in in Woodbury Connecticut were spent trying to convince my family that I was clairvoyant mm-hmm. and could predict the future and trying to convince myself that I was and I think that at one point my brother and I used to play cards all the time different types of kid card games and I remember at one point I think I predicted whether or not the next card was going to be black or red uh-huh. and then that happened again. <laughs> And, and I, at, at, at some point in my childhood, discovered encyclopedias, and I was such a nerdy kid. My parents had this encyclopedia that they purchased called World Book Encyclopedia. And I remember most of my youth was spent just reading the World Book Encyclopedia. But mm-hmm. I came upon this article on clairvoyance, and I was like, that's it. I predicted those cards. Right. I would sit around with a deck of cards face down, and the cards were face down, and I would put my hand my palm over the next card and I would try to see the color of the card and feel the color of the card and then flip the card over and see if I was right. And the times that I was right, I was convinced that I was clairvoyant, like I I convinced. And then of course my brother thought I was a complete moron and uh, you know, my parents (laughs) probably thought it was adorable, but like there's, there's been vestiges of that, which have (laughs) lasted until adulthood. I Mm -hmm. go to see, um, the, you know, the, the Seattle Mariners who are not the greatest team in the history of baseball. And, and last season I was convinced that any time I would like hold my hands up like a wizard in a really tricky or trying situation of the game. And I would hold my hands out towards the field. I, I was <laughs> desperately convinced that I was altering the course of the game with my wizardly <laughs> powers. So, yeah, so th- I'm, I'm sure that my friends have pictures of me casting spells on the Seattle Mariners just last season. So, <laughs> Amazing. I think, I think too, that it's, it's, you know, growing up in Connecticut, I think it's, it's easier to have a connection to these sorts of things than it is out here in Seattle, because, mm-hmm. you know, in Seattle, the history is, is much more recent of, you know, the, the history, the city's history is much more recent, mm-hmm. meaning that basically, in, you know, the way it happened was in the late 1800s, white people showed up, they chopped down all the trees, they killed all the natives. And then Amazon.com happened. It's like that's Seattle's history, basically. So in growing up in Connecticut, though, you have a constant sense of ancient native history. You have a constant sense of something that came before that is not here now, but mm-hmm. but whose like elements still survive. I mean, it's impossible to drive through Woodbury, Middlebury, Waterbury, and not have a sense of history being there before say Anaconda brass was there right. or before, you know what I'm saying? So with, with that in mind, you grow up, you grow up as I did. Um, I grew up, you know, s- spending time in, in cemeteries constantly. That's where you'd hang out or that's just in our state there. alone, you know, just all the stories from growing up, whether it was the, the haunted cemeteries or, you know, the, where the cults were in, in the fields of, of Middlebury or, you know, little people's village or, you know, Holy land, all these like just, whether they were older or newer constructs, you know, there are really just so many legends and so much mythology to this state. It's, it's all around you at all times, you know, in New England alone, it's like, it's, 
it's magical to me, you know. I, really, I agree. It I absolutely. love that feeling. I don't want, sometimes I really don't want answers, you know. I want to almost spin these yarns in my head over and over and almost but want to believe what I feel because it's truly just like nowhere else. Um, and venturing I, outside of this area, I've never, never felt like that, you know. I agree. Anytime I come back to Connecticut and, and to New England, I feel it. And it's, it's irreplaceable anywhere else. And I think that Europe certainly has, you know, much deeper history and longer mm-hmm. history. And I think there must be a European counterpart to that, but certainly in the States that, that sense of being in Connecticut. And, you know, I know again, where I grew up in Woodbury, the second I walk into Woodbury, it's just, there's ancient history all around. I mean, ancient history. All. And in fact, you know, if I'm, if I'm getting, um, you know, kind of, you know, personal about my own life, I think that I, I, you know, I can easily trace back, you know, I've been uh, straight edge for, you know, not drinking, not using drugs since uh, September 30th, 1988. This will be 30 years for me coming up. And one of the reasons I quit was because I was at a party in a field with high school friends in Connecticut, um, in, on the Watertown side of Woodbury, Connecticut. And people mm-hmm. can Google that if they're from other parts of the world. And I was, we were in a, we were in a field and we were partying and drinking late one night. And as I got more drunk that night, um, I, I remember, you know, kids were, you know, throwing beer bottles on rocks and going crazy and lighting stuff on fire and throwing garbage all around and disrespecting this place. And the sense that I got, not the literal happening that I experienced, but the sense that I got was that we were being watched by natives, you mm-hmm. know, in, in the dark, in the woods, and they were upset with us for destroying this land and destroying mm-hmm. the fields. And granted, at, at Nanawag High School, where I went to high school, we, we actually, I took an elective on uh, Native American culture taught by a Lakota Sioux man uh, named Paul Hadzima, who was teaching there at the time. So I was infused with Native kind of ideas just by way of him but i really felt that night that we were being watched from the woods and i was so upset by it and i remember crying and all my friends were like greg you're just drunk and i'm like no we're destroying this place and you know (laughs) they're upset with us you know so i get carried home but the next morning i went back to that field by myself with a bunch of uh plastic huge trash bags and i cleaned up the whole field and for me it was like an honoring of the past and an honoring of those who came before and i'm and realistically, I don't, I don't think I drank much after that. I mean, it was very mm-hmm. shortly thereafter that I quit drinking forever. So there was definitely a component of, of, of the unknown in that night, on that night of partying where I just remembered history as if it was still alive. Right. Yeah, feeling, feeling like the wings of history. And I have to add to that, which is what you mentioned earlier, I 100% agree with me being from the old country or the motherland or whatever you want to call it. There's a... Uh, a good way to, of describing it is to say, that, I mean, if you're in Sweden or in, I guess, anywhere in Europe, anywhere in Europe, you have uh, history and historical buildings, artifacts, monuments. I mean, here in, here in, here in Scandinavia, rune stones, they are a part of uh, infrastructure almost. Do you know what I mean? Yes. It's... it's uh, you, you have access to it at all times. And uh, I must absolutely give uh, the Northeast the same thing. My family, we spend a lot of time uh, uh, in California. But, I mean, that's nothing compared to the Northeast. I agree. And uh, the first time the trial toured Europe, we were in Italy, I remember, in, in the late 90s. And we were walking in Rome. And I was just amazed by Rome and the history of Rome. And I remember at one point, we were walking down the street with these Italian hardcore punk rock kids. And one of them pointed at a house as we walked by this house. And he said, this is the house of Dante. And I, I remember thinking, oh, I, was, I almost said to him, like, oh, cool. Your friend Dante lives here? Let's, let's <laughs> ask him if he wants to come to pizza with us, you know? <laughs> and then I, I saw this little plaque on the side of the wall, home of Dante Alighieri, you know, whatever no years he lived, 1340 or whatever it was. And I'm like, oh, my God, like, this is insane, the history here. And Connecticut, in its own way, feels that way, too, meaning there are these, you know, mile markers that Benjamin Franklin, Mm -hmm. you know, put in the ground, these stone mile markers. And then, you know, if you go to if you go to the the, the cemetery, St. Paul's uh, is it St. Paul's. I can't remember why am I drawing a blank? It's been years since I thought of the name of the church. But in the in the center of of Woodbury, right on Route six, the um, 
the uh, the, the oh. cemetery there has gravestones going back to the you know the 1600s yeah. and the you know 1590 and all this craziness and it's just so much history because mm-hmm. you stand on that spot and you think to yourself another human being who no longer exists who is long forgotten stood here 400 years ago and all of a sudden your brain just ties in knots at at, at all of the history that's still alive by way of what remains. You know, we're just to touch briefly when you said you were in the woods and you felt like a presence of like almost like Native Americans, like almost watching and like a feeling of like intruding on their land. And uh, it reminded me of this this story, which I haven't thought about since I was a kid, which is wild. You know, in, in Bunker Hill, where I live, it was all the neighborhood kids. We'd always just be hanging under a street light in the neighborhood, ages like 10, 11, 12. And there was this woman that used to walk um, daily by us short blonde lady. She was probably 10, like about 20 years older than us, you know, probably in her thirties. And, um, one day she stopped and, and talked to us and she said she was psychic and she w- would grab each one of our hands. And she started describing like all of us to a T on like what type of person we were, what we, how we act, what we would be doing, you know, in our free time. And, you know, she had, a, it seemed pretty legit, you know, and it was very creepy. <clears throat> and then she started telling us about the woods in our neighborhood and saying that it was haunted by a manitou, like an English, uh, Native American spirit. Sure. And she proceeded to tell us that she attended a wedding of a friend years ago, and they took all the wedding pictures in the backyard of this house, which was in the neighborhood. And she said when the film was developed, there was the whole wedding party in the backyard, and behind the in the woods, there was a Native American funeral procession going on behind it. it what? Was, and she came back two weeks later with this photo, and, and I wish to God I could would have had a copy of this. I don't remember who the girl is. I remember where she lived, but she's far, far gone. And, uh, and, and sure enough, there's this photo of a wedding party, like about 12, 15 people. And behind it, it's shadowy. You could see almost like fires burning and shadowy images of... You could make out someone in a headdress. You could see a corpse laying down and, and figures that were, looked like they were walking in a procession. And it was so wild to all of us. I've never seen anything like that. You know, maybe like 11 years old. And uh, That's unbelievable. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty cool. And you haven't thought about that story since you were a kid? No, not really. I mean, I, I thought about it maybe a few years ago. I never even, I've never said it out loud. I think I might have told one person years ago. But uh, it just popped up in my head now that when you were bringing up the woods, you know, and what kind of like mysteries and, and presence could be watching or, you know, what, what, what's deep in there. And that, what's, that what's great, Pete, is that the Stockbury dark has that effect on us a lot. <laughs> right. It does, you know, it'll bring up these, these things, you know, but, uh, yeah, now that I think about it, it was a very, very wild, wild image, but, uh, I don't know. We can proceed. <laughs> no, I'm I'm kind of stunned just thinking about that. I'm kind of yeah. blown away, and it, you know, it's just it's just it's so it's so interesting to think about. You know, if, if okay, so if we if we're establishing that there is mental energy between mm-hmm. people, and that's a thing, and we can't quantify it, we can't measure it necessarily, or at least the three of us can't. Maybe there's some smart scientist, and she's going to figure it out, or he's <clears> going to figure it out or some smart spiritualist and they're going to figure it out. But um point is is that if if we've established that that's a thing, then I also start to wonder about okay, so what is the deal with the dead and mm-hmm. the way that they manifest in the world that we see or right. or you know in the case of this native processional that appeared in this photo like is it always there? Is it mm-hmm. just unseeable unless it's captured on film? Um, I know that, you know, another story that happened in my family history along the lines of uh, energy emanating from the dead, which, you know, couldn't be seen or heard by people. My grandmother grew up in, in, in New York and lived in, as I remember hearing about it, uh, not, a, not a tenement necessarily, but a multi-level apartment building, I think, in the Lower East Side of New York, as I'm remembering family history. And apologies to my parents if I'm getting the details incorrect. But, but my grandmother, uh, as a little girl in around 1912, 1913, 1914, was uh, in, in, with her family, of which there were, I think, five brothers and sisters, one of whom was named Lewis, and Lewis was always very sickly. 
as the as the story goes. And there's a picture back at my parents' place of of the five siblings and and of this boy Lewis. And he eventually got sicker and sicker. And he, when he was about 12 years old, he lived on the top floor of this apartment building structure, apartment, whatever it was. And he was just kind of in the attic, I guess you'd say. And he was convalescing and being sick there. And evidently there was one day that was, say, on the fourth floor. Maybe there was three living floors and then the attic. And Lewis is in this attic and three floors below on the ground floor. The entire family one day was sitting and having a meal of some kind. And the family dog was sitting next to them on the floor. And this dog was always just very quiet and just a mild-mannered dog. And one, this one day, as they're sitting and they're having this family meal, all of a sudden the dog lets out this unbelievable howl, like this, mm-hmm. like, just kind of earth-shattering howl, and then just stops and puts his head back down. And my grandmother's mom, my great-grandmother, runs up all the flights of stairs up to the attic, and Lewis had died in that, in that moment. So, so while that's creepy and unexplainable and I don't know what to say about it, what it, what it speaks to in our conversation is, is there a feeling or a sense or an energy of when someone dies or when someone's born mm-hmm. or of the dead themselves that just kind of emanates through the ether that we can't perceive, but mm-hmm. that dogs can. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know. It's just so interesting. I mean, the role that the dead play in, in, in life. I mean, I almost want you to interview like a cocker spaniel on right. this, on the podcast. I mean, there's so them. many, there's so many instances of like pets or animals, any type of beasts that have these connections with, whereas almost people think that humans got so filled with everything else. They lost almost that primal part of their brain where there may maybe have been a connection, you know, to things like that. And, you know, with, with, with the advent of anything, whether it was a hundred years ago with books or now, but just being occupied and smashed in the face constantly with media and, and so much that, parts of our brains that were developed in that manner kind of just shrunk down and stopped working in those ways. But, you know, I, I couldn't say too much about any of that. I'm not for no. any of and that. And you're, you're on point though, with the development of, of not just technology, but you know, is that maybe distancing or, or disrupting the energies? Uh, you know, I remember reading that Otto Rank, who is a psychoanalyst in in the early 1900s, said something to the effect of, and I'm misquoting him, but the, but the the spirit of what he's saying is 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 true amidst this. He said that the world, and he said this around 1910, the world suffers from an overabundance of truth, the you know, the, the volume of which cannot possibly be consumed. And what mm-hmm. he was saying was. That you know, there's just so many, so many books and so many ideas and so many truths in the world that we couldn't possibly consume it all in our lifetimes, or even come close to you know, a, a speck of it. What would Otto Rank say about Instagram, Snapchat, oh. Reddit sub, you know, subreddits and the and the internet? He, he, he loses his mind, right? He oh, just loses just his an mind. endless barrage. You know, there's there's no thought anymore. Um, An endless barrage. So, so does that disrupt the 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 psychic energy flow, as it were? I'm just super curious to know mm-hmm. because you know I, I I'm I'm assuming you guys saw the movie The Witch that came out. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, so, oh. Okay. Multiple times. Loved it, loved it yeah. completely as well. Yeah. Amazing. So, like at that time, at that time, I wonder what was the world more filled with ghostly phenomenon because people literally needed to fill their experience with explanations for things they didn't understand and they didn't have the distractions or was there more ghostly seeming phenomenon at the time because because our connection and our ability to connect to it wasn't disrupted by the constant barrage of blue light from our cell phones Mm -hmm. and you know wireless connectivity that might be disrupting our our mental energy i don't know i'm curious about that now i think the answer is yes to both those theories. We've talked about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember my grandmother telling me a story about walking around in in Manhattan and having a newsboy yell out extra, extra, read all about it. Titanic sinks, Titanic hits an iceberg and sinks. And she she walked up and looked at the headline of the newspaper and it said Titanic sinks or something. And I was like, what are you, what are you, what are you talking about? A, a, a newsboy, extra, extra, read all about it, Titanic. <laughs> like, like, what are you talking? And, and, you know, this was her reality as, as a little girl. And I mean... <laughs> You know, we've we've we can romanticize and imagine that, but that was that was real. That was a time when 
you know, a, a traumatic or cataclysmic news event would yes. take a few days to reach the rest of the world or, you know, mm -hmm. a few weeks maybe. And I think life just moved at a completely different oh, pace. Yeah. And, and I think that we were the same animal amidst that, meaning we're, we're always searching for meaning. And, and this is why the internet is so seductive. We're always searching to fill the gaps in our mind right. that are that are empty or that are maybe you know in need of solving a mystery, and that's why we check Instagram thirty times a minute, and that's mm -hmm. why we want to post on Facebook that we did this or we did that so that we stand out in this world of information. But I think that people, by and large, you know, have have uh, have um, have been the same throughout time. And I just think that maybe a hundred some years ago that people filled those gaps in different ways in their mind and sought out different things and maybe were more attuned to actual energies or things that were happening around them at the time. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know for sure, but it seems to make sense. <clears throat> I, I definitely believe that as well. It's uh, like you were class of going back to just what you said briefly. We, I truly believe we are the last generation to have that connection with people from that past. You know, after us, there's there's not much history with people like that anymore. You know, growing up with people in our homes that were born in the late 1800s and and so on. These generations now are very growing up in a very modern age, and that connection has completely been been lost. Yeah, imagine imagine what's going to happen when someday on some podcast 150 years from now somebody says, "Yeah, I remember my grandmother telling me that she got a Google alert that told her that a ship had sunk." It's like <laughs> that's so different. You know, it's completely yeah. different. You know, she, actually she got a Google alert and an email sent directly to her brain that informed her that a ship had sunk. You know, it's not going to be yeah. as romantic a story. Definitely not. Definitely, Definitely. not. So, so, Greg, uh, oh, oh, yeah. go ahead, sorry. I was just going to bring up uh, Voodoo and Haiti, but go ahead with, with whatever that's, you'd like. That's exactly where I was getting to next. Um, oh, my God. The mental <laughs> see, we have that psychic connection. connection. <laughs> Listeners, that's a ex perfect example. It, Look it at what just, just happened. happened. <laughs> the stock very dark is bringing it back. <laughs> Very funny. Very funny. <laughs> so, so I've, like I mentioned at the beginning, I've done development work in, in Haiti for eight years now. And Haiti has a lot of rumors about it and a lot of untruths and a lot of truths about it. And there's a lot of mystery in this country. By and large, when, when people outside of Haiti think of Haiti, they think of voodoo, they think of poverty, they think, unfortunately, because of um, just rumors and, and untruths, they, they think of AIDS. Um, and, you know, this is most certainly a country that, while it's poor, is not a AIDS-infused and is not just ravaged by poverty with, with, with you know, subhuman inhabitants clamoring mm -hmm. to survive. I mean, it's a poor country, and but, but the people are people regardless there. Uh, the voodoo component, though, is interesting because, you know, and I'm going to preface everything I'm saying that this is me kind of white guy splaining the voodoo, meaning like, you know, you should have somebody on who, you know, knows voodoo, not just a white guy who's gone to Haiti a dozen times talking about this or 15, whatever it is times. <clears throat> But, um, you know, voodoo is a religion and it's a part of it's a part of Haitian culture for sure. And while most of the country is Catholic and Christian, um, the uh, the the infusion of voodoo is is everywhere. And it, and it appears kind of on the periphery and out, out of sight oftentimes. And I've often wondered if it's out of sight because I'm a blanc, you know, which is what they, their, their word for white guys, or white women, white people, uh, because I'm a blanc, I don't see it when I'm there, meaning they're not just going to like invite me in to a voodoo ceremony. But there are times in Haiti where in the dark you hear, you know, drums in the distance or, you know, you know of a, a, a ceremony or a fire or something burning going on, you know, whatever it might be. There are things which happen in Haiti which are, are kind of inexplicable. And I, I haven't had a, a ton of Haitian voodoo experience directly other than uh there was there was uh, w one guy explained it to me quite well one night and this i, I just have i just have to uh, stop you there greg and ask is it in haiti then is that a form of sanaria like similar to what to, to what's going on in cuba traditions and religious beliefs and spiritualism by camouflaging it with catholicism basically so uh, interesting 
Yeah, I think I thought like and and uh, yes, that's a, it's a it's a it, yeah. I haven't thought about that component of it, but that's absolutely true, and that's why I'm, I'm saying interesting. I'm like, yeah, that's right, because it was absolutely you know during during the time of of slavery, it was most definitely a religion that was was practiced in in secret, and a lot of you know even Creole itself, Haitian Creole as a language, is this amalgam of of of. African dialect and French, and it, it draws on all these different components and was created by the slaves amidst themselves for their own use. And I think that, I think that voodoo probably developed largely, and again, talk to an ethnographer or whatever it would be, a sociologist and what have you, um, a historian far more well-versed in all this stuff than me. But I think that a lot of it would developed as, as a means of maintaining community and was practiced in secret, uh, like yeah. you're suggesting. Yeah, so there was one night, and this is you know years years ago, where uh, where I was in Haiti doing work in the south of Haiti. We're in the back of a pickup truck. We're driving across the country, and there was a tremendous, tremendous rainstorm. Like the six or eight of us in the back of this um, truck were covering ourselves with a tarp and trying to hold it down, and getting pummeled by rain. And eventually, we had to pull over, and we pulled over in a small town. And in that town was a man who is well known in in his circles in Haiti as a professional guy. He's a he's a, a, a doctor, and he was uh, still in his tiny little office. And we pulled over to seek kind of refuge in his office. And as we went in, we sat down, and people were just hanging out, thankful to be out of the rain. And people, you know, cracked open Prestige, which is the local beer, and they were kind of hanging out, just you know, drinking some beers and relaxing. I went in the other room and sat down with this doctor and was and was speaking to him for a while. And after a while of just speaking about Haiti and politics and history, and this is a guy who's a bit older than than me, certainly. He's probably 65 years old or so. After a while speaking about Haitian history, politics, and 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 the current state of Haiti. I thought to myself, I got to do it. Okay, so I grew up watching <laughs> Serpent and the Rainbow, which yeah. whether or not it's it's fictitious or real, it has some real historical connections in terms of the the dictatorship there and and the Duvalier regime, and it's 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 on point in some ways. But it's it, for those who don't know the movie, it's a movie about uh, uh, voodoo and zombies in in Haiti. And one guy's attempt to try to understand it as an outsider. And my brother and I grew up watching this movie constantly. So I'm sitting with this Haitian guy. It's the middle of the night. We're by ourselves in a room. And I thought to myself, my brother back home, he lives in New York City now, is going to kill me if I don't take this opportunity to announce <laughs> this guy about voodoo. So I said to him, I'm like, okay, I have to ask. Tell me about voodoo. Tell me about zombies. Tell me about the hungan. The, the the voodoo you know priests and doctors tell me about the zombie powder tetrodotoxin that I saw in this movie in mm -hmm. 1987 and this guy a professional this is not just some wingnut lunatic this is a professional established guy went off for probably 30 or 40 minutes about voodoo and how it's absolutely real and how he explained to me that one way zombies are created and, and imagine, imagine like a, a professional woman who works at like IBM sitting down with you, telling you these things like this is mm -hmm. mind boggling. The two worlds combining. He said one way that zombies are created. He said the Hungan will take a bee and will take the bee and rub the bee on the clothing of the person they want to turn into a zombie. And then, um, they will uh, dip the bee in poison, in a zombie poison, he said, and they will set the bee free. And the bee will fly around until it finds the person that it was, you know, connecting to, the smell of, the scent of, or whatever, the, uh, the, the clothing. And then it knows it's found the person, and it will sting the person. And I always remember him saying it will peek, peek, you know, like meaning the, the word for like sting the person. Right. Inject them with this poison, and then the person will fall down. They will be as if dead, may be buried, and then the hungan will come and unbury that person, and then through applying them, uh, applying to them spells or potions or more poison, keep this person as a zombie because they're considered dead by their family and community. Keep them as a zombie slave. Okay, wow. now telling you this between Stockholm, Seattle, and Waterbury, Connecticut over a Skype connection is one thing. But when a Haitian dude in the middle of the night in the rain in Haiti is telling you this, you're like, holy crap, oh, yeah. this is the I'm craziest sure. thing I've ever heard <laughs> in my life. 
Yeah, so it's very real down there, and people really yeah. believe it. And I'm fascinated to learn more the next time mm-hmm. I, I go back this fall. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure, like, you know, voodoo runs very deep in that in that country. I mean, to hear the, the story firsthand must have been really, uh, I mean, obviously super interesting listening to it. Um, so the toxins that they use... From what I read years ago, was it like from like some type of blowfish or a poisonous yeah, fish shelf, or something? Yeah, blowfish. Yeah, and it would, you know, basically just paralyze the person to a, like a very like almost to a dead state, like a comatose state. And then, yeah, exactly as you said, they would bury, bury them, then dig them up, however much long later, and keep them in that state for for as long as possible. That's a. Uh, I mean, there, there have been there have been times when I've been in Haiti. And I'll preface this by saying that as, as, a, as a white person in Haiti, you're obviously far, 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 massively far outnumbered. And as a result, as is human nature, people will look at you like, oh, that's something different. You know? yeah. So oftentimes you, you are under the gaze of people who are you know, on the street or in villages or certainly as you're you know, you know, going between village to village in really rural areas, people are just like, what? Look at that guy. You know? mm-hmm. so, but, but there have been times... Uh, when I've been in, in places in Haiti more than once where the gaze that I'm receiving from somebody is, is arresting and mm-hmm. not just somebody staring at you and, and kind of hard style staring at you on the street and intimidating you, which happens all the time. That's just a, a thing. Um, but there was once I remember where there was a woman and as I was kind of, I can't remember if I was driving in the back, I might've been in the back of a pickup truck moving very slowly And she and I made eye contact from afar. And as I drove past her, she just kept staring, this stare that was staring right through me. And I couldn't break eye contact. And she was staring, staring, staring. And as I kept driving by, she was staring, staring, staring. And and I turned back, looking backwards now as the car is moving away from her. And she was still staring. And she stared until we are... Our, our eyes like link was broken by, you know, trees, houses, you know, the c- curve in the road or whatever. But I just remember getting the feeling that I just had an encounter with somebody, something. And granted, this is me applying meaning to it, but related to voodoo or something like, was this mm-hmm. a, or some type of spiritualist or was this somebody that nobody else could see other than me? Or it was just unsettling and bizarre. And did and you feel like it was menacing at all or? Yeah, I mean, there was definitely like there was something telling me to to to, to keep my place in mind, you know. Right. Like that's that's what I took away from it. It wasn't like she was going to kill me or chase after me, but I thought, wow, I'm going to see her in my dreams. Mm-hmm. Or uh, at the very least, she was the look on her face was know your place. That's what I got from it. Know your place. Mm-hmm. And, I love it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. And I I remember years ago, my brother was in a taxi in New York City and he was just striking up a conversation with a taxi driver. And there had recently been a woman uh, who was who was stopped at Miami International Airport with a human head in her carry on bag. Oh, God. And she and she was flying out of Haiti and she had landed in, in, in Miami. And she said that this human head was part of Haitian voodoo ritual. Now I'm going to immediately say that that's ridiculous. I've never heard of any such thing. This is obviously a crazy person with a head in a bag. Okay. But my brother heard about this story and called me. He's like, Hey, this woman had a head in the bag and and coming out of Haiti. And like, this is nuts. And we talked about serpent, the rainbow for two hours and blah, blah, blah. But my brother's in a taxi in New York, strikes up a conversation with the taxi driver. And the taxi driver told him that he was a, 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 a professor of voodoo. And, and that he should, my brother should call him sometime. And he gave my brother his business card. And I'll never forget, it said Jacob Pierre Louis, professor of voodoo with a phone number and an email address, all right? Or maybe it was just an email address. And he gives my brother this card. And my brother goes home to his wife and says, hey, you know, Greg and I are psyched. We, you know, th- this guy gave me this business card of this, you know, he's a practitioner of voodoo. We got to call this guy. And my brother's wife like freaked out. And she's like, what do you guys know? You're just a couple of hicks from Connecticut. Jacob Pierre Louis, <laughs> Jacob Pierre Louis is going to put your head in a bag, you know? So, so I still have that business card. It's literally right across the room from me right now. And every couple of years I write to Jacob Pierre Louis and I really? say, 
I have 100%. I wrote him three months ago and I said, oh, my name is Greg. My name is Greg. My brother wrote in your taxi. I go to Haiti. I'm very interested in learning more about voodoo. Please contact me. Not one email Never, has no ever response. been rejected. Well, here's the thing. Not one email has ever been rejected or returned. Mm -hmm. But I've never gotten a response. And I know, Jacob Pierre-Louis, that you're out there. And you might have sent that woman to stare at me in Port-au-Prince, but I'm going to keep <laughs> sending you emails. That would be such a, a, a great thing if he would respond to you. Um, oh, yeah, because then wow. he's your next guest. I mean, it's like you can have all the Scott Vogels and Joe Hardcores and Greg Bennix that you want on your podcast. But if you get <laughs> Jacob Pierre-Louis, it's all over. The real deal. The real deal. <laughs> Very cool. Greg, he will be there when you really need him. Oh yeah, I know we will be. <laughs> well, Greg, we know you have you have a short time, um, and you have to, uh, another engagement you have to rush to, so we won't keep you much longer. But I really want okay. to say thanks so much for being on the show with us today. We had a really cool conversation, and uh, you're an awesome guest, man. Uh, oh, this is amazing! I'm so happy to do this. I'm so glad you guys are doing this podcast, mm -hmm. and I can't wait. You know, you're I know you're 10 episodes, 11 episodes or so deep at this point, maybe 12. I can't wait until you're 100 episodes in and people can listen back on this back catalog and piece together for themselves, you know, whatever their version of truth is from all the experiences people have had who chime mm -hmm. in from all over the world. Yeah. It's going to be it's, great. Yeah, it is the coolest thing. Definitely looking back uh, when we get there, it's going to be a, quite an accomplishment too. But um, wish you the best with everything that you're doing. Um, You're a very accomplished person, like I said before, and I'm uh, super proud of you for all that you do. And uh, thanks so much again. Oh, thanks. Thanks a lot, guys. I appreciate it. Anything you want to add, Klaus? Yes. Thank you so much, Greg. This was everything we wanted it to be. This was a lot oh, of fun. I'm so glad. Definitely.